This Second. conference will now be recorded. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on those? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Okay, we're going to go with 3.1 storm water study presentation. Discussion only. Yes, this evening we have John Linder from Strand, um, Strand Corporation, and he will be presenting our citywide stormwater management plan. Okay. Uh, it's been uh, a, a very large and important project that we've undertaken with, with, with uh, their expertise on this, and um, it's moving forward. It's a very important process. So I'd like just to have John give his presentation so we can go through it. And ultimately, after the presentation tonight, if you have questions or anything, we'll, in staff, we can, we can talk with you about it. But ultimately, this will be going to council for approval and adoption um, in the near future after, after you have a chance to listen to the presentation, take it all in, and, and um, again, talk with us if you have any other questions. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to John. All right, thank you, David. Um, and Ryan and Scott, who I also worked with uh, on this, as well as a number of others. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about the stormwater management plan update um, that we, we did for the, the city. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, kind of plow through this um, and get you the information you need. But there is a rather thick report if you want more details um, that I believe Ryan has on his desk. Um, mm -hmm. So from an overview standpoint, we'll just talk about some introduction, um, the current updated stormwater plan, the Northeast Lakeshore TMDL that's prompting some of this um, work. Uh, we'll talk about some qu stormwater quantity or flood control uh, modeling, some stormwater quality modeling, uh, and then alternatives analysis for both uh, improving water quality and dealing with flooding and we'll talk a little bit about the concept level stormwater utility feasibility study uh, and some recommendations moving forward. Um, there's a lot here, but you guys basically have a WPDS permit um, that because you have a municipally separate storm sewer system or MS4, just to get a couple of monikers out there, the permit actually has already expired in 2019. I believe the DNR is working on getting that uh, updated. Uh, you did have a 1996 stormwater plan and then an 07 uh, plan that included some wind slam modeling that we're updating as part of our project. Uh, this table here shows some of the requirements that you need to meet uh, citywide. Um, and what we have here is a MS4 requirement of a 20% TSS reduction or set for, for sediment reduction uh, citywide. And then when the TMDL uh, comes in to play, um, at least for the purposes of this report, we have an assumed 40% TSS reduction, an assumed 27% TP reduction. Talk a little bit more about that is is uh, likely to change here shortly um, to different numbers uh, as they release that actual TMDL. The Sheboygan River, Pigeon River, Black River, and uh, tributary of Four Mile Creek are 303D listed waters, and when that happens, meaning they're impaired, uh, the uh, DNR and EPA says you have to have a TMDL or total maximum daily load um, that you have to meet. Um, uh, we've updated a lot of the plan because of uh, the changing requirements and the need to understand better understand the existing conditions, total suspended solids and TP removals or total phosphorus removals in the city and a variety of compliance options were evaluated as you'll find out. Uh, this is the actual permit on the left is uh, the cover page. Uh, on the right of the permit conditions, the work that we did for you is in bold, uh, illicit discharge detection and elimination program, construction site pollutant control, uh, post-construction stormwater management, pollution prevention, uh, how you take care of the city, uh, basically from street sweeping to leaf collection, things like that. Uh, stormwater quality management, which deals with meeting some of those numbers we were talking about from the MS4 and TMDL standpoint, and then updating your stormwater system map. And uh, yeah, the, the things here in gray are what we, we did as part of this project. Uh, the project cost was $211,900, of which you got $85,000 of a grant uh, through the DNR, which is uh, was nice to offset some of that cost. Uh, 
the current and updated stormwater program. These are uh, each of those. Um, just a second. I wanted to move something there. Um, so our report, the cover page is top right there, uh, which came out in September. Uh, so we looked at a lot of these programs or all the programs uh, except for public education. Uh, it's part of our scope. So the second one was illicit discharge detection and elimination. So that is to deal with uh, things going down the drain and out the storm sewer that shouldn't be there. And so there's inspections that need to be done. We updated that program uh, for you and uh, you have to submit that information to the DNR every year. Uh, on that, uh, construction site pollutant control, that's your erosion control ordinance. Uh, we do have a new Appendix D that has some new procedures in there that the DNR is looking for um, and some some new erosion, a new erosion control ordinance that will um, have to be adopted after re repealing the existing. Uh, likewise, on the post-construction stormwater management side, that is your stormwater ordinance. Um, again, to adopt new and repeal mm -hmm. existing ordinance, uh, there's some new requirements uh, in, in Appendix E uh, regarding how to track the long-term maintenance of those so that they continue to operate as designed uh, on a private and public standpoint, really, because uh, there's BMPs in the city and the private ones as well. Uh, we have in there some recommendations on initiating a program to gather maintenance agreements for private BMPs that you might not have. And of course, continue uh, when new developments come in to um, get those maintenance agreements for private BMPs. So you can take account, you can account for those and get credit for those uh, under the modeling that we're doing here. Um, pollution prevention and municipal operations. Uh, this go, gets into ma maintenance of your municipally owned stormwater BMPs. So you've got uh, 14 wet ponds that um, are slowly filling up with sediment and will uh, not only need like routine maintenance, but, but dredging out from time to time over the years. And so we we talk about that within this as well. And of course, uh, the annual report, I believe, gets done by Scott. And he's works with various departments there at the city to track quantities of street sweeping, catch basin cleaning, um, de-icer, anti-icing, leaf collection, and staff training, all the, which the DNR is interested in. Uh, and then we put together a stormwater pollution prevention plan at the municipal services building where you're at to look at ways to reduce pollutant runoff uh, from the site. So that's in there as well. Uh, stormwater quality management uh, was wind slam modeling. Um, uh, SLAM stands for source loading and management model, and it's in a windows environment such as uh, thus wind slam. And this is the DNR's model that they want us to use. And so we did that and some alternatives analysis. Uh, updated the stormwater map, uh, system map, and the annual report is due annually March 31st. Oops. Okay. Um, on this uh, public and private BMP maintenance program, uh, this is really something that's kind of new. And we worked with uh, Andrew. Uh, uh, there at, at the city on the GIS side uh, to do some automated tools or GIS tools. So every year there's going to be some inspection needed to be submitted and tracked on the public and private side. And this, this tool can be used uh, certainly on the public side. Um, the, on the private side, the private are, would be doing this with um, some inspection forms that we have um, readily available as well. And then uh, that would be a yearly inspection just to see that it's all generally working and every five years uh, a certification by a, by a qualified professional that the BMP is operating as designed and this is a little more uh, robust of a of a look at these so like a wet pond you would you would take a look at the depth of, of water in there um, and once it gets less than uh, three feet it's it's in need of, um, of dredging or, or some sort of uh, improvement, uh, likely dredging. Um, but this could be for a bioretention basin or other things that uh, occur. Um, and uh, and so that's this is kind of the system to appease the DNR in terms of uh, making sure that these things are working as designed. And if it is not, uh, then the owner provides corrective maintenance plan 
um, routine maintenance within two months of assessment. Some of this could be, I don't know, um, it's getting overgrown or there's erosion or things like that. And non-routine maintenance would require submittal of a plan within 18 months. Um, um, oh, the, the maintenance within 18 months um, of submittal of that original um, uh, plan for improvement. Uh, so if you if it had to be dredged, um, if the five-year plan, five-year certification said it needed to be dredged, uh, well, then within 18 months, it would need to be dressed according to the, the plan we're setting up here. Um, and lastly, on this slide, we have a table in the plan uh, with the stormwater budget and we're setting course at least the cost to design and dredge one pond every far, every five years of your 14 ponds starting with design in 2025 and construction in 2026. So um, it's something to start thinking about. The DNR is concerned that these ponds are filling up and nothing is really being done about them. Um, and so it's something to put on the radar. So this is the Northeast Lakeshore TMDL map on the left. Um, that's the area that has all these streams that are impaired. And there's a do document that's coming out shortly um, that's gonna say, well, in order for you to not be impaired, you need to reduce your pollutants by this amount, okay? And that that's in the form of a percent TSS or sediment reduction and a percent TP or total phosphorus reduction. The timeline is on the right. Um, they are a little behind the, their schedule. I have this yellow arrow. Um, we were supposed to get draft allocations in midsummer, and now we are going to have a webinar in two days um, that's going to um, roll out those draft allocations. So we'll be able to see what those new numbers are. And uh, I, I think Scott um, is gonna be attending that um, on behalf of the city I'll be attending as well, so. Uh, so I, I'm going to go first into stormwater quantity modeling because this was part of the project, uh, not associated with the stormwater permit per se, uh, but part part of the grant and part of the scope of services at the time. So there was flooding over here on Union um, that was a problem, and so what this is is an XP uh, a representation of an XP swim model, which is a hydraulic model that. Um, simulates the uh, rainfall runoff um, process, okay? And so we have pipes in this and we have the ground surface and when the pipes can't handle the, the storm flow under a given storm event, the water comes onto this surface and you can see um, like here on Union, this is the flooding area. Um, this is during a hundred year storm and you can see some of the depths um, and, and one could zoom into this to see it better, but um, for purposes of this, uh, this is um, what you can see in this extent. And then, uh, so so then along uh, Wilson Avenue, likewise, uh, there is uh, some flooding that's occurring along there that prompted the need to, to study this. Um, and we'll zoom into this a little bit later, but that's what this type of modeling shows. Uh, this is supposed to show basically what you see out there when it rains in these bigger storm events. And I think it, uh, corresponds pretty well to what some of the things Scott and um, David and Ryan had said were, were occurring. Um, and then when you take a look at how to improve this, uh, the things you can do is either upsize the pipe, which is on the right. Um, it's uh, It's got uh, it, the existing pipe size is sitting here um, in text and then there's the color is the new pipe size. Uh, for a 10-year storm, and then the uh, we looked at a detention basin up here on that Union um, uh, Union rail yard, uh, and you can kind of see wh where that is. So the combination of the two, we're looking at how could that improve flooding that occurs in that area. And uh, south hotspot area, we did look at a number of ponds to help with that, including the Dollar Tree wet pond, Wilson 14th underground wet pond, and the Wilson Avenue and 9th Street proposed uh, wet pond um, to help with that. Uh, let's see. 
these were the conveyance upgrades, and it's a little hard to see on this one, but you can see these pipe sizes on the top right. Those are the new pipe sizes. There's, uh, it would take you some looking at this, kind of com comparing things if you were really interested in what the, the change is. Uh, but for example, this 50, the 60 inch, whoops, this uh, 54 inch here uh, would have to go to a 72 inch in order to pass the 10 year storm event. And so um, we have new pipe sizes that would accomplish that in, in the report. Let's see. Uh, this is just a zoom in um, along uh, Union, uh, excuse me, Wilson, um, to see that a little bit better. Okay, so the uh, north hotspot area um, up at Union. Uh, so this is just a comparison of what it looks like before and after. So on the left side is um, a more zoomed in version of what we saw before. And on the right side, if you put in these pipes and that uh, that detention basin, you still have a little bit of flooding out here at Union, um, but it's um, it's far smaller, and that's that's the improvement that that you see when when you model it. Uh, this one was the South Hotspot area again, zoomed in uh, along Wilson. You can see that uh, up on top some of these existing flooding areas that are pretty uh, severe up in here, and then after you put in the three detention basins and the upgraded storm sewer, you can see the improvement um, kind of in this area by the school. Um, uh, kind of that, that problem goes away. Uh, we still have some uh, some flooding uh, down over, over in this uh, west end that um, could be looked at in the future. Uh, it's just there's only so many things you can do to 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 uh, when you don't have area in in the area so um, or open area in the in the flooding area so that's um, a look at that uh, and when you look at the costs the cost for these upgrades for the conveyance which is the pipe upgrades on that north hotspot area 1.7 million uh, south hotspot area 15 million. Um, and the table below is, are the different detention basins we talked about and their costs, um, including the Union Avenue underground wet detention basin at 1.9, the Dollar Tree, the Wilson Avenue 14th, Wilson Avenue 9th, uh, some of the, the costs there. Um, thing to note at the bottom here is that the wet detention basins and underground wet ponds provide flood control and stormwater quality control, especially along um, uh, along Wilson with the Dollar Tree and the, these three here um, will provide dual benefit. Um, and then lastly, on this slide, uh, one thing we talked about uh, was that uh, one could go ahead and put the detention basins in. We know they're going to help um, and to potentially provide sufficient improvement to help reduce flooding in the hotspot areas before you put in the cost um, of these 10 year storm sewer conveyance upgrades. So it's something to, to kind of think about. Okay, so onto stormwater quality modeling. What we have shown here is on the left, what's considered baseline conditions or no control. So this is the pollutant load uh, of TSS or sediment in pounds per acre. Uh, kind of shows like the darker purple and uh, blue areas, uh, sort of that green, I don't know if that's cyan, um, those are the higher pollutant load areas. And so when we go to the right side, uh, is existing conditions or with controls or with all the different wet detention basins and things you have out there, um, you can see a shift in some of the like red areas here go to um, more of a yellowish, orangish color here, meaning there's a BMP in this area doing some good and so we use these maps to try to highlight where we could put additional BMPs to get additional treatment. Uh, and this uh, top graphic uh, kind of talks about the results of the stormwater quality modeling. 
uh, under existing conditions. So we talked about before about a 20% TSS reduction for MS4 requirement, uh, and then this Northeast Lakeshore of 40% TSS, 27% TP assumed. Uh, the modeling results are right here. Um, we had citywide is 25.5% uh, meeting the MS4 requirement, but not this assumed TMDL, leaving a 14.5% gap between 25 and a half and 40 to get there. Uh, similarly for uh, TP, uh, we're at 18.1% uh, difference between the 27 and 18.1 is 8.9. So there's a fair way to go to get there. Uh, and when you look at the bottom table and turn this into pounds of uh, total phosphorus or total suspended solids, that's over here, that's really what we're looking at is trying to get 500 more pounds 500 more pounds of TP reduction um, to close that gap um, to get this assumed 27% TP reduction. So that brings us to alternatives analysis. And this is just a graphic of how, how one goes about this. Number one, it's understanding the DNR rules, which we do through, um, through then grant writing for getting monies for the stormwater quality modeling. Okay, so we're doing that under a grant. And then once we know where we're at, you can design and construct BMPs within the city. That's one way to comply. You can do what's called watershed adaptive management. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. This is um, DNR's way of trying to um, get lower cost compliance. But in, in this case, you have to be in the jurisdiction of a treatment plant and the treatment plant has to want to do this because they have their own requirements. Um, in this case, it doesn't, at this point, it doesn't seem like there's any traction towards this in Sheboygan, um, which then brings us to water quality trading. It's another sort of supposed to be lower cost uh, compliance option. So once you achieve that 20% TSS, what you do, you're allowed to do the water quality trading. And that's basically going out into the ag community and trying to find practices you can do to um, reduce uh, total phosphorus and total suspended solids. Um, so one of the big things we did for you on this project was to look at where is where are these potential projects, okay? And so the, here's a bit of a laundry list of these on the top left. You can see basins that are drawn up. Um, one thing to note, we are proceeding right now with the Second Creek Dry to Wet Pond conversion. Um, we assisted the city getting a grant to fund part of that, part of that with grant funds. Uh, to improve that, to, to incre increase the total phosphorus reduction by 27.8 pound, pounds, excuse me, tipping into that 500 pound deficit that we're trying to reach. Um, other things that we look at are, and DNR is allow, allows you to do is 20 years of redevelopment at 40% TSS um, uh, will get you 67.5 pounds over a 20 year period. So you can cumulatively take uh, credit for that um, as as things redevelop in the city. Uh, we also are talking about changing from monthly to uh, once every two weeks street sweeping to help with this to get 78 additional pounds. And then this water quality trading kind of helps us make up the difference. Um, so we've got 10 pounds there and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Uh, this is a location of those BMPs um, uh, from alternative number one. And so you can see they're kind of throughout the city um, and, and some higher priority than others. And we are working on the Second Creek one, this project right now. Uh, a little bit more about water quality trading. Um, it's really, you're going up into the agricultural land and the map on the top right looks at some of the reaches that are, they call reaches or watersheds within the TMDL um, and you can, you can trade with agricultural land. Um, you can trade with other MS4s if they have, um, or other communities, um, if they have excess uh, treatment plants, private point dischargers, if they have excess. Typically people are going after agricultural land, uh, water quality trading if they're going to at all. Um, and, um, uh, but there, there's certain steps you have to do to do that. It's not, it's not a simple thing either. Um, but 
the third bullet here is uh, Wisconsin Act 151 in 2020 created a framework for a third party clearinghouse or water quality trading clearinghouse. And that's it's supposed to allow you to um, sort of buy in and to this third party that would do projects and kind of ease the uh, the burden of, of trying to trying to do it yourself. Um, and the cost range on this is 125 to 150 pounds. Um, $50 per pound of TP net present worth, um, potentially higher. Uh, we'll see how it all plays out. The table on the left is some of these potential trading partners with treatment plants and other MS4s, um, and then some private point dischargers will, will be in uh, a table in the draft TMDL. Um, and then watershed adaptive management I talked about, and this is where point and non-point source sources work together to protect and restore local water resources. And so you need one or more local treatment plants to initiate. Uh, it involves agricultural BMPs, like BMPs for water quality trading. Um, some of the differences and things is um, the treatment plant would get a lot less restrictive interim phosphorus limit if pursuing WAM, uh, uh, watershed adaptive management. Um, it can extend over a 15 year time frame up to three five-year permit terms. Again, those two bullets were more of a treatment plant um, issue. Um, and then benefits of this are you can get to a 62 to $125 per pound range, uh, but it really assumes cost share dollars are available and counties provide technical outreach assistance. Uh, and if you look at the bottom right, there is an example of, of people doing this in the state. Yahara winds down here in, in the Madison area. Um, MS4 is buying at $50 a pound um, for TP and Madison Met, uh, Metropolitan Sewerage District administers the program. They work with Dane County, who is a broker with agricultural BMPs for ag BMPs with farmers, and then USGS has to do water quality modeling, uh, monitoring, excuse me. So there's some people out there that are doing it. There's not a lot. Um, and it seems right now that there's not anything going on in Sheboygan County. Um, and there's a, a few other differences here, if one were, were interested in, in knowing the difference between water quality trading and, and watershed adaptive management. Um, so um, our analysis boils down to three alternatives that are a mix of different projects. Uh, alternative one being eight structural BMPs, plus non-structural BMPs, um, plus water quality trading at a cost of 22.8 million. And that dollar per pound TP removed is at 2280. So the lowest of these three. Uh, alternative two uh, takes a little bit different uh, look at that and uh, alternative three as well. So you can see the different 20 year net present worth and dollars per pound removed. Uh, what's included in these? Uh, alternative one, eight structural BMPs, uh, relying on this 40% TSS redevelopment requirement for redevelopment over 20 years, increased streeping, street sweeping one pass every two weeks, and some level of water quality trading with agricultural lands. Um, number two is uh, similar, uh, except it only has seven structural BMPs. Um, and so it's, uh, it, we just selected a different, or got rid of one BMP. Um, Let's see. And then alternative three was four structural BMPs, but looking at 80% TSS requirement for redevelopment, which is a higher standard. Um, and then uh, one pass every week, every week for street sweeping and more water quality trading with ag lands. And so in the end, we, we kind of kept running with alternative one as the lower cost alternative of these after discussing it with um, Ryan and Scott and David. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll look uh, more at how this would be implemented in a, in a bit here, um, but I wanted to get to the concept level stormwater utility. I know there's some talk about with all these new uh, costs, um, maybe being a driver for for a stormwater utility, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the past here too, what you guys have been been doing. So um, we'll talk stormwater utility basics. Mm -hmm stormwater utility budget, some next steps, um, benefits of a stormwater utility and implications of non 
compliance with MS4 if you don't want to go down the path of compliance. So in the city's case, uh, we came up with a stormwater budget each year of, that's about 548,000. Um, and if you take that out of, um, or take a look at what portion of the total city mill rate that is, that's about um, uh, $0.2 per thousand. Um, and so if a property is assessed at $100,000, you'd pay approximately $20 per year or 40 if it was 200,000, uh, et cetera. The stormwater utility is based on the fact that um, the developed land is the primary urban source of stormwater runoff. So the top left graphic is a, you know, a basic field where water hits the ground and wants to go straight down rather than run off. Develop land on the right, you have lots of imper impervious area where that water just wants to run to stormwater infrastructure that needs to then be maintained. Um, and uh, so the second bullet is the rate structure would be based on impervious area. So whereas a water utility, you might have a meter reading, your meter, at least for stormwater, is impervious area because that amount of impervious area determines how much stormwater runoff you will have. And stormwater fees are seen as fair and equitable based on runoff from impervious area, uh, similar to water usage. Uh, you're using as much stormwater infrastructure as impervious area that you have. So, so it's a good comparison. So on the left graphic, um, an equiv equivalent runoff unit is considered 3,100 square feet, and at least in this example, which would be one equivalent runoff unit, um, and so if you went to a non-residential property on the right, you would have many more times that. In this case, in this example, you'd have 1.4 million square feet uh, divided by that 3,100 square feet gives you a number of 465 ERUs. In this case, um, you know, for this, this non-residential development. And on the bottom left is just a look of how a stormwater fee would be added to a, a utility bill, in this case, uh, Whitewater. Uh, so just some basics uh, for the city. Uh, you, you all adopted a stormwater utility in 2003. Um, you charged fees in 2004 and 2005 around $36 per ERU, I think, David, if, is, is the number that we had discussed that was, that, was the, that was the annual charge john it was three dollars per eru so 36 oh, okay. that was three dollars per year i'm sorry that's all right um 36 per year i'll make that change on there um and then uh stopped uh charging fees back in 2006 uh for a variety of reasons uh so when we look at a concept level stormwater utility feasibility study today, 2021, uh, the number of square foot per ERU is 2,470, uh, 49,683 ERUs in the city. Uh, and your budget range, uh, once we put together an implementation plan of how you're gonna do this work, um, range from 550,000 up to 3.7 million, that was an annual rate. Um, on this basically 26 year planning period. Um, and then the ERU cost range would be $11 to $58 uh, per year um, along that route if you were to reinitiate a stormwater utility. And just for comparison's sake, there are 123 existing stormwater utilities in Wisconsin, and here's some average rates, um, $5.45 per month on the average, 71.45 per year, ranging from 11 to $210 a year. So, um, you know, what we're talking about here is well within the realm of what others are doing. So this is that stormwater utility budget table. A um, lot of information in here, but it, breaks down all the different components of, of things the city has to do to be in compliance with the stormwater permit. Um, and at the bottom of this, you know, I talked about these, this $548,000 total and how that changes from year to year and what the annual cost per ERU would need to be. And that projects out 
I, I mean, I only have through 2025. We got that projected out through 2046. Um, so there's some, some good information in here on, on projected costs uh, that we're working from. So I guess the thing I want to share here is that depending on how much you charge annually, you can get a certain amount of potential revenue, right? In this table 704-1 to meet whatever need you might have and the need being shown on the right. Um, and, and so that's where that annual charge would go up here year to year. Um, the other thing to note on the bottom left um, is the reallocation of funding contribution by land class under a stormwater utility. So what happens on all stormwater utilities is the cost gets shifted to who's got more impervious area um, and who is um, tax exempt. Okay, so let's just look at a couple of things like single family residential on the left um, under a property tax based system, they're paying 52.7% of the cost, uh, whereas under a fee base, they're going 24.3% because they actually have less impervious area than some of the other um, areas. So you can look at tax exempt. That's how that works. Those would go up because they're not taxed right now. Um, and now they would be uh, would have a fee based on on the storm on the uh, impervious area. Uh, likewise, industrial uh, and manufacturing would go up as well as commercial. Um, and that's because they have more, generally have more um, impervious area. So, so if you were to go forth with this, um, with a stormwater utility, the 2013 Wisconsin Act 20 puts a bit of a um, impediment to doing that because they say that the shift, um, if you shift costs to the utility from the general fund, you need to reduce the levy limits equivalent amount. And if you um, don't want a reduction of levy, limit, levy limits, you need to pass a referendum. Um, and the, I guess what I would say is, is recommended that the city attorney weigh in on the city's ability to revive its stormwater utility that was adopted in 2003 in light of this Act 20, uh, because you technically have one that's been adopted and so do the levy limits apply i think they one would make a case that they probably do but i think we just um it, it's something that you will want to talk with with the uh, city attorney about so on the right the graphic uh, i'm showing is uh, of course we have our stormwater plan update we did this concept level stormwater utility feasibility study if you did want to go forth into stormwater utility implementation there are a fair number of steps in doing that, um, including what we typically re recommend as a task force to um, to talk with um, the affected parties and and uh, major landowners and things like that to to talk about how this works. Um, so every, every so everything's transparent, I guess. Uh, so. You know, we'd have to finalize the rate study. We'd have to do a billing system review, stormwater utility master account, develop ordinance and credit policy, uh, billing system tech, uh, testing, impervious area map book, public information and meetings. And some of this, some of the work done previously um, you could probably be utilized in some fashion. And so if you want to head down this path, we would talk with, we'd be talking with you on how best, how best to do that, I guess. All right, uh, so we're getting close to the end here, um, but stormwater utility benefits, uh, it provides an equitable, stable, dedicated revenue source for stormwater related projects. And I think most communities that have these like, like them because of, because of that, because um, there's always gonna be a need, uh, especially when you're in a TMDL situation or have flooding issues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, credit call, Credit policy could reduce rates for non-residential customers. Um, uh, revenue source allows planning and paying for stormwater quality improvements for MS4 TMDL compliance and stormwater quantity improvements for flood control. I guess I already said that. Um, and here's some kind of bigger picture benefits of completing at least stormwater 
quality projects um, under a stormwater utility, uh, regulatory compliance, water quality, ecology, and fisheries improvements in lakes, rivers, and streams, reduction of erosion in channels and creeks, quality of life and aesthetics improvements, uh, resiliency to climate change and promotion of green infrastructure, while on the flood control side, uh, potentially reducing uh, lawsuits, replace aging infrastructure, reduce flooding and ensure emergency vehicle access and preserve property values um, with people not being worried about flooding. So, so the implications of MS4 non-compliance, I've sort of always asked this is, you know, in the short term, if you don't, if you're not in non-compliance, the DNR will work with you on a path to compliance. Um, if you elect non-compliance, what I've been told is DNR has the authority to refer the community to the U.S. Department of Justice, potentially subjecting the community to, to significant fines. And that's, um, nobody wants to go there, I don't think, but uh, that's, these are the answers I give just to, because I don't know that there's a better one. <laughs> All right, so recommendations on the MS4 program side or your stormwater permit side is to continue your existing and initiate updates to the stormwater programs discussed in section three. You're doing a lot of good things right, um, but there's generally increased documentation for annual reporting. Um, you need to implement the modified illicit discharge screening at the outfalls, and I know I'm talking with Ryan about a task order on that side of things. Um, the new erosion control and stormwater ordinances, the new construction site procedures, the new long-term maintenance of, pu of both public and private stormwater BMPs or best management practices. Uh, on the stormwater quality side, so we talked about alternative one and you saw some of the graphics of the stormwater ponds. Uh, we have a whole section five that talks about this uh, and you can look at the table there, um, but on a constructed BMP side, um, pursue DNR urban on point source grant funds for any constructed BMPs. And, and we started down that path with the city on the second creek dry to wet pond conversion. And that's a great example of, of how to leverage the DNR uh, urban on point source grants. Um, the next grant application deadline, um, oh, I messed that up, um, is April 15th, uh, 2022. Um, and I think, uh, Ryan and, and David and Scott, the um, we can determine the priority of what to go after next after this webinar, because uh, that's going to give some um, uh, waste load allocations specific to different parts of the city, and uh, that would help us home in on which which project of the ones we defined you'd want to go after. Um, on the water quality trading side. Um, uh, you could could further investigate opportunities with other MS4s and private point dischargers to the extent they're available, though I think the Water Quality Trading Clearinghouse under Act 151 is gaining some traction here. Um, it's probably a few years out before you really see what that's all about. Um, the DNR did have a an RFP for companies that were interested in being that clearinghouse. And um, that's a bit in its infancy yet, but I think you'll see some things happening there. Um, watershed adaptive management, if it materializes in the future, reanalyze city's position at that time. As I said, um, I'm not aware of anybody going down this path yet, and it would have to be led by a treatment plan. Um, one other thing you could do is get a total phosphorus credit for your leaf collection program and you could complete an analysis to determine that that wasn't something that was part of our scope. It's something that the DNR is offering in the last couple of years. Um, and we've helped some communities figure out um, if they qualify for this credit based on how they pick up their leaves in the, in the fall. All right, uh, stormwater quantity, uh, consider pursuit of conveyance and detention upgrades discussed in section six provide flood relief at those two hotspot areas. And then there are DNR municipal flood control grants available with the next grant application deadline being March 15th of 2022. Um, these are typically 
things mm -hmm. where monies would become available uh, the next year and you'd have to use the money in two years. So it gives you some time to to budget for these things uh, uh, that way. Um, uh, lastly, stormwater utility, consider reviving the stormwater utilities as described in section seven or budget appropriate amounts in general fund to fully implement stormwater programs. Um, so that's the big picture on recommendations. The the implementation plan, and this is something that DNR uh, requires from the permit, is how are you going to lay this out? How are you going to do all this? And and so if you look here at the bottom, they want you to get 10% of that TP reduction gap by 2030. Uh, that number is 50.1 out of that 500.5, I guess, rounded. Um, and so um, we've laid out a plan here to every basically every four years do a project on the stormwater quality side. And you can see the Second Creek uh, one here uh, is in 2023. Um, we're designing it in 2022. Um, when that actually gets built is um, in the, you know within the next year, let's say. And so then it gives you this list of projects that you can pursue. Um, whether or not these, this is the exact order uh, the DNR wants to see in order. Um, this seems to be a good order because Wilson and Ninth um, would be probably a good one because it does flood control and stormwater quality control, uh, as well as the Union Street underground. The, the, the next two, we kind of put those in for that case because they do provide water quality and quantity or flooding benefit. So if you want to know more about that, there's more discussion in the, in the report. Or if you have any questions, I can certainly answer them. Uh, with that uh, brings us to uh, questions and answers, and I can leave this screen up. I'm trying to figure out if I can see anybody without. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcus. <laughs> Go ahead, Marcus. Hey, John, we got some questions. Just hang tight. Yeah. John, um, you're going to have to forgive me. A lot of the stuff in your report was uh, wonky, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. Can we start with what are TPs? Quick definition. Oh, total phosphorus. Total phosphorus. Where does total phosphorus come from in the city of Sheboygan? Okay. The total phosphorus comes from runoff from land, okay? So um, perhaps... How does it get on the land? Does like just me having a plot of land just generate phosphorus, or how does it get... Yes, there? yes. The... The way this goes is this this wind slam model was put together based on a bunch of scientific data um, with monitoring of land of runoff from the various different land types. And what they found in the storm sewer after runoff events included phosphorus and TSS and uh, an array of, of pollutants. Uh, the DNR and EPA have decided that total suspended solids and total phosphorus are the pollutants of concern. I think if you get rid of those, if you, if you reduce those pollutants, you reduce other pollutants um, in general. But yeah, there's a there's a pollutant buildup um, in our environment um, of TSS and um, and phosphorus for sure that, that you're regulated on at least. So um, it is like phosphorus a fertilizer for what yep. percentage of the pollution in the rivers currently is coming from agricultural land versus what's coming from our city? So I, I don't know that number exactly, but the, the TMDL document, which hasn't yet come out, ha has um, probably breakdowns of that because um, we didn't we didn't model agricultural land, so I wouldn't be able to give you that number. I, I do know what's at least modeled to come off um, the city of Sheboygan lands. Uh, okay. Um, so a lot. And, and, yeah. and there's a lot. And, 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 <laughs> and, and lot. here's, and here's and this, this is a, a debate we have quite frequently with the DNR. And the DNR says, we don't regulate agricultural lands. That's another agency. And, and, and the farmland runoff is controlled, and they have buffer strips that they work with the farmers and that. So they're not nearly as regulated as the DNR. 
for urban environments. And a lot of like what John is saying, we you know that's why street sweeping is so important because it picks up the, the the solids and debris, and that's where a lot of the runoff and the the TSS is total suspended solids, and that phosphorus attaches to those solids, and that's how it gets into the water, and that's why when we have the retention ponds, if there's solids still in the street or running off a of property or running down drop, uh, downspouts, that runoff gets to the ponds, that settlement settles down, and then clear water then releases to the rivers and streams. So that's all the kind of the whole philosophy in a real quick scenario, and sorry John to interject, but I'm just trying to, so you can get your head kind of around some of the, but as you saw, since 1996, we we have that debate frequently. We, we construction site erosion control. We have many construction sites. We put up all these barriers to control runoff from these construction sites, but right next to it, when we're out in the edge of the community, there's a farmer that's plowing up acres for his corn with no set, you know, so, it's it's frustrating, but again, it's it's two different agencies and it's and it's land uses and it's um, regulated uh, differently. So yes, it's but it's we have to comply. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the bottom line. Right, you have this MS board permit. If you don't comply, well, what the DNR will do is they'll stop all development until you comply with this permit. They're talking yeah. about doing yeah. all these requirements yeah. in this book. It's um, okay. Um, so. Then my next question, still on just definitions here, uh, what is DDE and the inspection of outf outfalls? Oh, uh, IDDE is illicit discharge detection and elimination. It's a fancy word for basically looking at the end of your outfall to see if there's anything coming out that shouldn't be, such as oil or grease, uh, stuff that people might have dumped that should not be in, in the waterway. Um, and just to be clear, the outfall is the point in which the sewer stops in the river or stream begins? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what is a Vortec unit? A uh, Vortec unit uh, is basically an underground um, treatment unit. I think you guys have it down there. I, I, um, it, it, it treats okay. stormwater before it goes out. It's, it's a box underground that has a wet pool in it. It's a it's a specialized manhole, okay. large large chamber that in an urban setting we don't have a lot of yep. area to put a big pond. Right. We'll put one of these units in. It's a Vortec. It's kind of like a brand. Okay. And what it is is it 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 has a chamber in there that will separate some of the oil from the water and some of the debris, and then it has also a settling basin within there, and then it will again. It, it's like a mini cleansing type of okay. system. Um, it can't handle a lot of water, but in tight areas where you're, you're like next to a parking lot where you can catch a lot of the, the stuff that's going off of cars yep. and cigarette butts and you name it that can be in a, in a parking lot, it helps. Okay. What is a BMP? Uh, best management practice. Okay. Which is the stormwater, the underground stormwater. The in, in, in a variety of issues, like our street sweeping program, our, our, our recycling that we collect used uh, motor oil at our drop offs. We get credit for some of that type of activity. So it's a variety, a long, big laundry list of management practices, best management practices, I guess, that all add up to credit on your program for water quality. And then my next question, John probably wouldn't be the best one. You might be the best one for this one. Um, it seems like the DNR is putting an unfunded mandate for us to have cleaner water and the state legislator, leg, legislature is not allowing us to raise taxes in appropriate level to take care of that. So we're trying to go through a stormwater utility and then just charge our people more to take care of this? Well, the, the, they would say that you already have a permit and you had an opportunity back when, in the early, in the mid 90s, and we had a utility and we were funding this. So and they, they have programs all the, to grant monies to start up utilities to get this all going and so forth. So all this is is really um, a rewrite and an update of the permitting program. So it's um, they're adjusting some numbers and it's based on water quality. So water quality is not improving with what's happened since the 90s in some cases. In many cases it has. 
and, and as I think he's, you could see, there, we, we have on that one slide where he had the city and he had red areas with nothing in yellow where we've had improvements, but we have to go beyond that yet. We're not quite there. And, and in order to get there, we have to do additional improvements. Now, if we the city kept the utility back when it was, we would be probably in a much better position. But you're, you, this, the things they're mentioning, we mentioned 20 years ago, unfunded, why, are we, why is this coming down on us? How are we gonna fund this? And they, they had grant opportunities. They say, get this in place. And that's why you have 123 communities in the state that have these utilities now in place. My final question before I relinquish the floor um, <laughs> would be specifically, if we are going to fund this somehow, most likely through our taxpayers with either a fee or a, um, a, a, a impervious area equivalent or whatever that was. Uh, I, I was looking at a map of acuity. It looks like they have several detention ponds already. Yep. Were they going to get credit for that they, because they, they're already they, taking they, care of their stuff? Right. They, How they, does that work? They, they would. There, there's a policy within. If, if we if we would go down the utility creation and look at that, there's a whole another uh, policy that gets developed for those that treat their own runoff on their own property prior to it being discharged, they would get credits for that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I guess I have the question going the, 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 the um, with that, how would this, the, the, the tax levy is the biggest question is how is this going to affect our tax levy? Are we going to, are we going to have to roll back tax levy because I, of that? I, is that, I guess that's a Thomas because he said, the, yeah, the city attorney would have to. It, 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 it appears that way from everything that, and, and I think what we, we'd have to do is work with the, with the attorney's office as well as the mayor's office and, mm -hmm. and, and, and your your the yeah. common council, all the persons, mm -hmm. and we might have to talk with our state legislators and say, hey, you know, Sheboygan had this. Is there any opportunity with the new budget or, or carving out legislation that, you know? We understand if, if you're a new community and you want to do this for the new, but we had one. Mm -hmm. And really, it's still in place in our ordinance. It's just our fee is zero today. We're not charging a fee, but it, it, the mechanism in the ordinance is kind of in place. So that could be the debate, I guess. And that's what we would have to investigate. Okay, how would we, if, if that is something we would want to pursue in the future, that's how we would, we would have to set up some of those talking points and how, how could we go about it. Okay. Mr. Chen? Yes, go ahead. So I want to, um, you are using interchangeably tax levy and, and utility? Uh, no, they're, they're one or the other. Right. So, if you, so it if, would be either uh, one or the other would be implemented, right? Correct. Okay. So as far as the utility goes, um, I understand that the utility would be the utility fee would be based on ERUs, right? Yes. And the ERUs uh, are determined through um, the quality of the water or through the impervious land or both. It's based on impervious land. Impervious land. So it doesn't matter who pollutes most or more. Well, it it it. It's, because I assume that manufacturers pollute more than residents, so um, wouldn't that be should that that shouldn't that have an impact on the calculation of the if not of the ERUs but to the parameters by which we um, assess utilities? It, it's it's in theory I, I would agree with you but in, in in practicality we couldn't we can't test every source of runoff from each property so what they do is they base it on quantity so it's based on here's the impervious area so when it rains a quarter of an inch this property is going to send this amount of quantity therefore it's calc you know, it's it, there's a calculation that's easy easily identifiable and basically within that water column, it's pretty consistent in terms of what that runoff has within it. And is, is that that is common practice or there are other practices that are implemented? For example, based on what a manufacturer produces. I, I, I John, I think if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 
the, the standard practices on quantity and impervious square footage. Yeah, it's so it's easy. just based on impervious square footage and, um, you know, it, I mean, if there's flooding issues as well, you have a storm sewer system that conveys water that's not necessarily water quality based. So that's it. it the, the utility is paying for a mix of things, not just water quality, it's water quantity and conveyance. Um, and the standard practice is this ERU calculation um, nationwide. Okay, I have just, to, I don't want to take much more of your time because I know that Andre has more questions, but I have two more questions. One is, do we have, so we are we compliant right now? Yes. Well, yeah, with, the, with our current permit, yeah. we're, we're in compliance with our current permit. We're, we're, we're scheduled for a reissuance and based on some of the new parameters coming out, they're going to say, we're not going to be meeting those new standards. But there's a timeline. They, it's not like here you go. Here's the new standard. You have to you have to meet it tomorrow. So they, where, they, where are these when are these new standards going to be in effect? Um, well, we, we'll get a preview in two days, and then then there's a public hearing. I, I'm, I'm assuming later this summer or, or early by fall. I, I'm not quite sure what that schedule was. I'm gonna I'll move to it here real quick. Um, this is so. What has to happen is you have this webinar, um, they're going to uh, eventually, so those will be draft allocations, they're mm -hmm. gonna have a public hearing, uh, and then if there's comments that would change these draft, these draft allocations, they would make modifications, issue a, um, a final TMDL document, which ends up going to the EPA. EPA takes a number of months uh, to review that, and they're talking about uh, anticipated start of the TMDL implementation phase of, I'm just going to say January 1, 2023. Um, but it could be later that year. These things do drag out a little bit. We're, we're behind by six months, so mid-2023 maybe. Um, again, that's not, that's to me just speculating based on the timeline they've, general timeline they've given here. Right, so we are we are currently compliant mm -hmm. with WDNR, but we we already know that we will not be compliant with the new parameters becoming affecting, right. let's say, in a couple of years. We know that already. Right. Part of it is like 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 John mentioned, we have 14 of these retention ponds in the city, and they were all built 25, 30 years ago, like the one at 29th and Healy. Mm -hmm. They were they were the standards. Now they're not anymore, so they have they got to be rehabbed, I guess, for for a better word. They just need to be. You work on. Yeah. And finally, I just wanted to know historically how often it happens that WDNR goes after cities that are not compliant. It's, I'm oh. just curious about that. Was that question how often do they go after people that are so non compliant? If, is not, if a city is not compliant, how often does in actuality happen that the WDNR goes after cities? Uh. Non-compliance. Well, I, well, I can. I not, I'm not sure about the permit non-compliance, but I can tell you on parameters for best management practices. We've been we've been cited as a community on on, on, on projects that, if uh, for for instance stormwater or for erosion control from a construction site, if there's uh, de deficiencies or failures in there after a storm and they, they there's an inspection, they'll say it. Get it fixed. Get it fixed now. And, and so there, there's a dialogue, but you know it happens. Mm -hmm. And they're 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 it, it's a it, it's their role and they're they're the enforcement agency to protect the natural resources. So they take it very seriously. And so what we're trying to per, tell you here is it's 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 important for the city to take this seriously. And um, it is a lot of money. But we're, we're going to figure out a plan to, to continue. And I, I think as you'll hear later on this evening with another presentation, there's um, there's there's steps that we're going to be taking to ultimately uh, track this better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for the presentation. Thank you for the patience. And thank you for the answer. Andre, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, how does an underground or underground wet pond work? 
and I'll ask my second one after that. One. <laughs> it's 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 very similar to an above ground. It's just um, there's there's really no open space. So we have 18th, one one at Eighteenth and Wilson. Yeah, Eighteenth. Um, our, our meet. Yeah. So what, there was a section by uh, Mead Avenue that has had historical flooding in the past. And what it is, is we built basically an underground vault with concrete uh, sections of, of, of pipe. And uh, it fills up. It pretty much is it's empty during normal times. But when it rains, it, it will fill up and, and store water in there temporarily to reduce flooding above ground. And then once the, the, once the rain event stops, Hopefully within short, you know, it's for, it's usually for short, really intense periods, not for long, prolonged, long, heavy periods, but it will fill up. And then once the rain stops, it will slowly recede to smaller pipes that can handle it. Mm -hmm. What happens is a lot of times we have these big downpours, huge rain, the pipes aren't large enough, things will fill up in the street, it stops raining, you never notice how it just goes away after it stops raining, mm -hmm. That's things are able to catch up finally. Okay. And my second question was about the total phosphorus. Um, I think I'm looking at the right thing. It says, uh, so if I'm getting this right, um, the phosphorus goes into the stream, and then that, is that sent to the wastewater facility? No, not and, that's, and that's the, that's the, the difference between you know, all the storm sewers mm -hmm. are directly connected to streams, rivers, and Lake Michigan, for sure. Okay. And that's, so that's, it, it's a separated system. Okay. Um, Steve at the plant also treats phosphorus within the wastewater okay. as well. So he's got a limit as well, but it's different than what this is. Okay. If you collected all that storm water, we need a plant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, then that clears it up a little bit. Appreciate that. Very good question. Yes, I, I, okay, I got one. Other. Um, so now you're, you're, you're mentoring the dollar tree. The, are these plans, ideas where we, we were thinking about putting, or ideas that we have that now this, this grow, and do we have have we have di had dialogue with like the rail you know, with the rail to to, to be even, they be open to these things yes we don't not know. Not, not yet no okay. and, and again that that's why we wanted to, what this is kind of conceptual this is the plan these are you know ideas at this stage then okay. you know again we're going to focus on some of our existing the 29th and Geely is probably yes. upgrade that and we get some credit for phosphorus removal right away with that project and it's it's a facility we already own eventually yeah as we get further along in those extended out years we're going to have to look at some of these other projects and in private partnerships or private property acquisition potentially i don't know as you can see stormwater management is something a city the size of Shibuya. a mid-sized city fifty dollars mm -hmm. it's it's complicated it's complicated and it's, and it's expensive <clears throat> and there, I was going to say there are grants um, for both the urban on point source and the municipal municipal flood control grant. Both um, you can get money for property acquisition, you know, if that's part of it. Uh, so first Marcus and then Grazi. So we're already like a mid level taxing municipality inside of the county. Um, if we're adding another 40 bucks to each homeowner on a yearly basis or some number, does that same kind of cost get passed on to people who have septic systems out in the town of Sheboygan, or are they going to just be a more attractive option to go and live in? Um, you know, those, that's the same type of question we heard in in 2000, whatever, uh, two, two, yeah, two. It's we're, this is going to be a detraction for people to not build in Sheboygan. They're going to move all out of here, and um, for two years it, it, we didn't see it. And again. The, the 123 communities that have it, it, it so it's not like you're, you're going to be able to pick up and just move to another community that doesn't have it, in other words. Um, the, the, in terms of the business and the factories and the, the business sector, I mean, we have the infrastructure, we have the critical mass of employees, um, but I, it, you're right, I, you know, you know you're, you're penalized for being a, a, a city. In other words, now the outlying areas are under the same rules. Cool. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have, they're going through the same thing, and they're going to have to figure out how to pay and make their improvements. The city of Falls, city of Plymouth, you know, Kohler, 
town of Sheboygan. So it, they're all part of our watershed. Mm -hmm. So it's not like just because they live next door and they're not a city that they, it doesn't apply to them either. You've answered my question well. Thank you. Okay. Browser? If I understood correctly, you were predicting a $11 per EIU as a utility fee. Would you think of the same type of increase as far as tax levy? I, I, I mean, the equivalent. Yeah, I guess if, if we, we, we have to take a look at, you know, the program, the budget, and if we went to the utility, we would look at the total ERUs that we have in the city and come up with a dollar figure. In the past, back in 2000, it ended up being $3 a month for a single family residence in the, in the city of Sheboygan. So $36 annual cost. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, and that, that generated, I, I, I want to say about $1.2 million on an annual basis. And I, I'm, my memory is fading a little bit. So <laughs> a little while. Yeah, but I mean, in all, in that that covered a portion of operations such as street sweeping, our our operations at the service building here for maintenance on the storm sewer system, but it also was a large portion that went to capital projects. <clears throat> Now you build that up over you know five years or four years where you you have let's say a half a million dollars that is set aside for projects, you have $2 million or $2.5 million, let's say, then you can build one of these larger infrastructure projects to help meet these controls. So that's kind of, you don't need it all within one year. You, it, it slowly you build up and then you do one of these larger projects, maybe once every five years. It's not every year I need $2.5 million and I got to get this all done. There, the DNR, as long as you're making progressive progress and you're showing that you are doing an effort and you're doing projects, they'll work with you. So this is also has the goal of us getting a permit, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So would we get a permit regardless of when we will be able, let's say we would be able to progressively become compliant with a, in a five years, 10 years range, would we get the permit from the Wisconsin no, DNR? We're, we're, we're going to get the permit regardless of, uh, I guess, we're, we're going to have to have a permit. It, it's Then the question is going to be, how do we fund it? So do we just continue to fund it as we're doing today, tax levy, and then go out for borrowed money and go out for bonds and then build a project with bonds? We can also use grants and, and, and use that. That will help reduce some of the cost, but it's not going to pay for ongoing annual programs that are, are going to be added as, a, as an expense to this. So that that's, you know, we might, the first five years, we might not need a utility because we, we, we use some grants and we have some capital um, improvements planned and we, we're going to borrow the funds. But... As we move forward, and as you look at it strategically, we have other capital projects. We have roads to build, we have sewer systems to put in, and so now you start competing with your road program, your road, you know, maintaining your roads, because you're working. Now. It's you know, there's a limited there's a limited source of pie of funding, in other words. So we can only slice that up in so many ways. And if you you take a large piece to fund stormwater, that's less to go for roads are less to go to a fire engine, are less to go to other programs, for instance. So that's that's the kind of the, the, the next discussion in terms of where we're going. I guess I have a question. Um, does it have to, if we do it as a utility, does it have to be run through like with our, with our water bills? That can it still be added on to our tax bill? Or is it only tax levy, only allowed on tax bill? Because the one thing is, is you, you hear from a lot of people the complaints about it just keeps going up. The, the, all the other fees going on. That's the constituents' complaints. They would almost they'd rather just have it on their tax bill. Is that possible? And I guess that's a question for the future. Yeah, I, I, that I don't know. Good question. Because <clears throat> that that's one thing people would rather they would for almost prefer to have it on their tax bill. Sure. But not necessarily as a tax lever. We could and, do and, it as a utility, but as a on our tax bill. And, and, and here's here's another thing to consider is we as a city 
are limited on our tax levy yes. uh, by the state legislature. Yes. So yes. if we want to add this just to the taxes, yeah. we might not be able to because it's too much. Mm -hmm. Then we, then it will be kind of gone to a referendum. Do we want sure. to go above our levy limit to fund this program? And so it, it's 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 we're going to get to a point where we're going to have some of these real tough decisions of how do we pay for all these different programs and what's the best way to do it. I mean, I think. I think you know a lot of community input and dialogue on this. I, I'm not saying the utility is the only way to do it. There's many ways to fund this. We just have to make sure the community understands the options and what's what do they prefer. Well, I guess my my, my question is: is it, to still do it as a utility and not as a tax levy? Can that can we can we build that onto a tax bill, or is that or is that a no no? I, I I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry, Jim. Okay, no problem. All right, I guess anybody else have questions? I guess I guess we're good. I really appreciate all the presentation. Yes, this is a lot of thanks, John. A lot of information. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. This has been a lot to digest. I guess. Yeah, and, and again, that's why we we're not. We just wanted to because we want to present the data. There's going to be some ordinances and resolutions coming in the future to right. adopt some yes. things, but take some time. Okay. <laughs> all righty. Well, thank you all for, for listening yeah. and uh, the, good, the great questions and try to pack it all in. And if you have any other questions, let me, let me know. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to sign off and, and have, a, have a good rest of your meeting. Okay. All righty. We'll move to 3.2 and 3.3 and 3.4. Because since they're all related, we're going to put them all together as one. Uh, resolution 107-21-22, 108-21-22, and 109-21-22. Authorizing and accepting a easement for mini sewers, Molitor, Pilon, and White. Yep, we have, we're, we're, we're installing it on mini sewers this time of the year. We're talking about four, eight parents, five people, backyards, so they can connect their sump pumps to it. In the back of their house. One was over on Riverdale Avenue. We need an easement to get in their yards, mm -hmm. South 10th Street and Westmont Drive. To approve. Yeah. Second. Just a question. Mm -hmm. sure. I was um, reading about what easements are mm -hmm. and how I know. Um, can you just explain that? Okay. You let's say let's let's say let's say we need we need to put a pipe in someone along someone's back property line. Mm -hmm. That 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 homeowner owns a property. It just gives us permission to put that pipe in there and maintain it. Mm -hmm. it gives us an easement forever. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is put a pipe in, and the homeowner says or business, well, you can't come back here anymore. To fix that pipe or maintain it. So it gives us permission to use to use that property, but it's very explicit just to maintain that pipe and uh, and to install it. And right. Usually, these easements are like five feet wide. It's not like they're fifty feet wide. They're, mm -hmm. you know. And there are no conditions, right? There is no fee exchange, no money exchange, no, symbolic right. money exchange, right, right, no, right, right, none right. of that. It, the, the reason the neighbors will give us these easements because we're we're fixing their problem. Obviously, there's some pump runs constantly in their backyard. They can't use it, and they, you know, it just it's just it's all wet. So now they put in a pipe in their, their yard is a lot nicer. So that's that's a trade off. Plus, they don't they don't um, they don't uh, pay for the, the the insulation of the sewer either. Mm -hmm. So if they want to, if they want to easily give us the easement, then that's yeah 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 we don't we don't pay for it at all. Thank you. <clears throat> Alrighty. Motion is made and second. Any other questions on it? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Those are approved. Okay. Resolution 3.5. Resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with J.H. Hossinger Incorporated for the re renovation of 1817 North 8th Street to be used as the new location for Uptown Social, the Sheboygan Senior Activity Center, and authorizing raising the appropriate city officials to make the necessary budget adjustments and appropriations to fund provide funding for this contract. Mr. Chairman, um, as you just uh, have your item for consideration in front of you this evening, um, Purchasing Agent Bernie Romer has uh, provided the, the following background. Uh, we had two bids. Um, J.H. has in your construction on Menominee Falls was the low bidder. Um, they meet all the requirements. And um, I know Emily from the senior centers here. I think Chad's online and Thomas has done quite a bit of work as well in terms of reviewing contracts and funding because 
we are one of the key components is the, the large portion of the funding is coming from the this this CBDG um, funding loan from the feds okay. and um, I know it's quite uh, complicated but Thomas and Chad have really worked hard to secure this and uh, I know Emily's really excited and as well as the seniors and um, I guess if you'd like to entertain any other questions with uh, the rest of the participants, that would be fine as well. But looking for your approval. I'm curious about a couple of things. So go ahead. Uh, do we normally uh, seek more than two, seek three bids, mm -hmm. or we just go, if there is only one bid, what do we do? Or we seek at least two, or we go for three, I don't know. Uh, we, we've, we've had bids where we've only had one contractor. Um, we, we look at the engineer and construction estimate of the project, and if it's well above and doesn't make sense, we will, we will reject it. But if it's one bid and it's within what we've looked at industry wide and it's it, the numbers look good, we can accept one bid. Um, in this case, there was like, I believe five different contractors that showed up for the pre-bid meeting that looked at the project, were interested in the project, but given the, the economy, supply chain, and work that's all out there, only two were really interested in, in pursuing the project. <clears throat> and would they do the whole project completely? Phase one of construction. Right. Mm -hmm. They'll have subcontractors that will work under the general. So they, the general is responsible for, hi, for hiring the plumber, the electrician, the, that, so. Very good, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, this is Chad Pelishek. If I can just add a couple. So the Section 108, as David referenced, is a CDBG, a federal uh, advancement, basically, of our yearly entitlement. Um, we, Thomas and I have worked on this for over a year, and we had a conference call today, and it looks like we're going to finalize this and get our first uh, slug of money sometime in the first week of January. Um, what I would say is this, it's funding... The Section 108 would fund 2.7 million of this uh, project. There's 500,000 in there for reimbursement of the purchase price. So the total Section 108 loan is 3.2 million. The difference of roughly 786,000 or so is coming from the city's contribution from the American Rescue Plan grant. Um, there is some stipulations related to that funding program though that uh, we're going to have to work with uh, Emily on as she gets into the building as it relates to maybe being a site for future mm -hmm. vaccinations because that's where the funding is coming from. But we believe we can work through those things uh, and fund the difference to be able to award this contract tonight uh, between the two programs, the two federal programs, the Section 108 and the American Rescue Plan, and then a small contribution of 89000 from the Friends for the Senior Activity Center um, to deal with a uh, pillar or uh, podium or whatever you call it in the middle of the gym. So, um, everything I think is in order and we feel comfortable moving forward and we have a few minor adjustments, some documents that'll come into council for the section 108 uh, over the next two council meetings, but everything should be ready to award this and start moving forward with construction. Hi. Any other questions? No. I, I, I move to approve. Second. <clears throat> Motion made and seconded. Um, I guess my, my only other question I have is, is, uh, is um, are, they, are they looking at any uh, local subcontractors at all in this? I believe so. Uh, I don't know who, though. The general, the general will be outside. Okay. So whoever that general wants to pick for subcontractors, that's that's going to be up. That's going to be up to them. Hopefully, okay. it'll, it'll be some local, you know, some okay. local subcontractors like David was saying, plumbing, electrical. Okay. I know that. I know the the mechanical. Some of the mechanical subs that were there were were pretty much all locals. Okay. I know. Yeah, but I, I have yet to see who they decided. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Terrible tie. That is approved. Okay. We'll go with 3.6. Okay. 3.6 resolution re 115 20, 21, 20, 12. 
direct referral a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Spec Electric Incorporated to replace the generator and perform related electrical upgrades at the municipal service building. This is Mike, thank you. So yeah. so yeah. First, uh, okay. first of all, I want to thank Bernie Romer and uh, Attorney Cameron and stuff like that for this, um, for getting all the, all the paperwork, the agreement with Spec Electric and everything, getting this thus far. This is a project that we started early in, early this year, in January, with um, MSA Engineering. Uh, they, were, they were the electrical engineer that spearheaded this project and stuff like that. They were also spearheaded um, the City Hall project. No, and, you know, they're, and I think that through the city, we worked with MSA for, you know, um, on many projects throughout so many years. Um, so this is one of those progressive things that um, David has started, and I am, you know, I am fully with this. It's just progressing on updating this building. It's going to be a 56-year-old building in a few more weeks, just as David is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Ready to hang out with us. <laughs> so all, the, all this is is replacing 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 the original generator, and along with all the electrical panels that are outdated, meaning we can't we can't there are no serviceable parts serviceable parts and parts that we cannot obtain anymore. So this is really a 21, 22 kind of project. It kind of morphed into one because. Um, Engineering it as one project saved almost ten thousand dollars just in engineering costs. So we here we are at the end of the year, and it's it's just basically the twenty one money is going to roll into twenty two. You know, we'll be talking to Caitlin and stuff like that. Get those funds transferred. Um, it just it's aged. There's going to be some value in the generator that we have for reselling and stuff like that, and that's another thing that uh, uh, Mr. Roberts is going to probably end up putting on Wisconsin surplus maybe help this a little bit. On the good side, um, we're well with well, we're well within budget. So I think we have budgeted in the, in the area of four hundred thousand dollars and I think the um spec electric came in around three twenty eight. I'm sorry I don't have the numbers. Um uh, about three hundred and twenty eight, three twenty nine. So um, we're well within the whole budget for the generator and the electric panel update for twenty one twenty two. The bad part. So we just got kind of got updates a little bit. It's not bad, but with the supply chain and everybody knows, you know, here yeah. in this room what the supply chain looks like right now. So we just got a small update. We're almost looking at 60 weeks out for just the generator itself. Um, that pushes me into 23. I'm not. I'm hoping that changes as we go into 22. Um, there's a ton of work that they can do prior to the generator installation, meaning. Um, what they have found for the electrical end of it is there's so many updates that need to be done on well, I don't want to get into the electrical code, code 700 if you want to get really bored with it. That's That, that takes a lot of lighting, um, uh, emergency lighting, and it all has to get updated. So, but that's all, it's all within this whole budget. Um, like I said, we have a really, really good cushion, you know, about $16,000 cushion. Um, if there are any unforeseen things that um, Spectre Electric comes up with. So I'm open to any questions okay. on this one. <laughs> so this is just this is basically just a continuation of what we already yep. for this is just this is the second phase of this is basically what this is. With this is phase one and phase two put together. <clears throat> okay. Because okay. because the way the way they fit off each other. Okay. Um meaning it's all electrical and rather sure. than trying to bid this out twice and mm -hmm. doubling doubling my cost with engineering costs. It was the engineer who really suggested to David and I, why don't you put, bring them together, save that 10 grand, yeah. and uh, bring this all into, into basically one project and bid it out as one. And we, I think we would like get, you know, we got better pricing doing it this way versus trying to do it on two separate years and stuff like that. So, okay, um, go ahead, Andre. Um, you said the next generator might not come till 23. Will the current generator hold out until yes. then? Yeah. Okay, and I mean, uh, it's. We've hobbled along for you know 55 years, or not 56. <laughs> um, it's a strong generator. It's very undersized. We're you know we're we're installing a generator. We um, are quoting out a generator that if DPW ever needs to expand, mm -hmm. that generator will still hold that expansion up to almost half the square footage of this building. Mm -hmm. So it's not a generator that's we're just locked into this. It's a generator that will bring us well into the future. So and is 
Is it, and will that be within the time frame of to be within compliance for updates? Oh yeah, yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, we're in the for the core part. We're within all those updates, and that's the engineer looks at that as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Now we're going to go with 3.7 through 3.9 because they're all the same also. Um, well, they're different locations. They're different locations. Do we want to do or do we want to do? We'll do them separately. We'll do them separately? Yeah. Okay. I'll, like I can talk okay. to them. Okay. 3.7, General Ordinance 3021-22. Document 6.1, an ordinance creating parking limits so as to <coughs> add a two-hour parking limit between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. except Sundays and holidays on a portion of the south side of Union Avenue between South 14th Street and Henry Street. Okay, an in individual that recently purchased this building at the corner of 14th and Union um, bought the building and they're, 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 they started the small business. And what they'd like to have right now through this area here is it's pretty much unlimited parking. Just in front of their business here, they would just like to have a two-hour parking limit. With their business, a lot of people just come in, pick up whatever they get, and the way they go. So they're asking for one spot, two-hour parking, um, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, this Monday, Monday to Saturday. Very reasonable. There is no parking over here on this side of the road right here now because the road is so narrow. It would never support two, two, uh, two sides parking. And if you look at some of the smaller businesses along Union Avenue, they, 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 a lot of them have the two-hour parking. Mm -hmm. There's several small businesses in this district. Which, so. which business is that? They, they just started like a like a health business for vitamins and stuff like that. They just recently opened it up. It was the cobbler. Yeah. Oh, okay. I heard of it. Um, so. Okay. Move to approve. Yeah. Second. Motion made and seconded. Yeah. Any other discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye. That's approved. I'll go to 3.8. General Ordinance 3121-22, document 6.2, an ordinance creating a no-parking zone on the north side of Union Avenue, west of South 25th Street. Yes, this uh, had some neighbors. Um, Union mm -hmm. Avenue, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely busy street. I really got a good dose of this. So last summer, we, when we reconstructed <laughs> Union Avenue from 26 up to Taylor, I, this street gets a lot of traffic. And it gets, it gets somewhat parked tight from, from uh, Wisconsin Sausage. And what happens here is vehicles just park so close to this corner. And part, part of the reason people park so close to the corner is there is no crosswalk marked here. The reason there's no crosswalk marked because you can't put one in because the crosswalk will lead right to someone's driveway. Mm -hmm. A lot of times if there's a crosswalk marked here, we'll, 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 make the, we'll really make, emphasize that people see that and they kind of use it as a, as a boundary of where to park. Yeah. There's nothing here. So we just, we're just going to pull back parking 30 feet from the corner here. That's all we're going to do is to clear that corner up a little bit. Some of the neighbors, it's, I, I've, I've gone by there several times and, they just pushed in a little bit. And really, if you're pushing to 30 feet, you're really, you're not even taking one spot away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you're not putting a big herd in the neighborhood. So again, their, their request <clears throat> makes sense. So, so that, that would be to prevent that people keep parking mm -hmm. in the corner? Right. They park, so, to the corner. they park real, real tight to the corner. Because there's no <laughs> crosswalk there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no crosswalk here. And, and there never will be because it leads right to, the, right to someone's driveway. You don't, you don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. So. That was, that was the request. It made sense. So. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. second. Can I Motion made and mm -hmm. seconded. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Mr. Chair? Mr. Yes. Can, can we have to go back actually to the generator. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Because what we, I just have to have an amendment on the account number. Okay. We uh, it was the, a There was. The account number in the original resolution is is wrong, so I apologize for that. Okay. So I, I, I need to did. Um, I guess I guess Thomas, how do you want me to do this? Do we have? Well, to? Thomas is off right now. I think oh. what we have to we're going to amend it. So um, yeah. Thomas is working on a sub resolution. Right. Um, because this was a multi year, there's a difference okay. in account numbers due to the fact that some of the original funds were borrowed and the funds for 2022 yeah. are not. So I think therefore the Marcus, account number you need the original resolution to approve it. Yeah. So if you would say, if I would like to amend the original resolution to, then and then someone could second it. That way we can get it. Before. I would like to amend my uh, original motion to include the change in account numbers per whatever needs to get changed when I'm given those numbers. 
Motions be made and seconded to, to amend. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. I'm, I'm just thinking. So shouldn't we have that? Oh no! It, so it's conditional to the amendment. The approval is conditional to the amendment. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. Okay. okay. So when this goes to council. They'll will have right, this so document we, we amended with the sure correct. And you will have an amended sure resolution. The amended, the amended yes. Resolution. yes, that is okay. correct. Aye. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any opposed? Thank you. Chair votes aye. That is approved. <laughs> okay. Then we go back to 3.9. Or no. Yeah, 3.9. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, General Ordinance 32-21-22, document 6.3, an ordinance creating Three no parking zones in the vicinity of Greenfield Avenue and South 9th Street. Okay, this is the Sheboygan uh, Christian High School area, mm -hmm. and starting this this last year, I guess, like in May, they they, they closed their school down on Gilly Avenue, where all the yep. I think uh, kindergarten to eighth grade, yep. yes, and they put an addition on. This. this is an old area. They put an addition on bigger bigger parking lot, everything. Now all their students from kindergarten through high school. Or at this location here, so therefore, obviously, it's, it's gotten busy with traffic and everything else. So our department's been working with us with the Sheboygan Christian High um, School on on getting it to be orderly for parking, and they actually do a really good job of educating the parents for pickup and the school buses. They they, they do all that on their own, but they do have one issue here with this skewed intersection. Uh, people just come a little bit earlier to pick up their kids for whatever reason, and they park this corner super tight. So we just want to put some no parking, kind of like similar we did on Union, 30 feet, stay away from the corner, and then uh, no parking around the corner here, and also no parking right here, just to keep that intersection opened up. It's it's narrow, as you can probably see, uh, Greenfield, mm -hmm. and uh, it's skewed. So that's, that's all they ask for. Otherwise, for the most part, they do all their own. Um, I, I've been out there, they, like I said, they've, they've done a good job of... Uh, Educating the drop off and pick up out there for their for their, for their students. So that's all they're asking for, just to clean up this intersection a little bit. And again, you're not really putting any hurt on the neighborhood up there because there's really there's no houses around there. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcus. Um, is it really um, that much of a benefit if we um, stop along the park to park that uh, closest corner to the school? Right here. Yeah. So, like, what does that hurt? What are the, what are we not being able to see? A, a they don't want. They, they don't yeah. want um, people parking parking. Mm -hmm. right, like, yeah. They are they using the that crosswalk? Cross yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they, plus, they they just want to keep cars away from this corner because I know I know they've done a lot of um, outreach in the neighborhood. That's one of the complaints they've gotten from the neighborhood is that the intersection gets so congested in the morning for you know and also in the afternoon. So I'd say. They, they do a good job there, so right for drive through, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes very difficult. Yeah. So that's so all it is. You are going to put how many of them? Uh, no parking them? here for 30 feet, no parking around the corner here, and also then no parking right through here just to keep that open. Very good, that's thank it. you. Yeah. I move that's to it. Approve. Second, Made second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay, then we go to 3.10. Resolution 112 2122, document 7.3, resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute agreements with Rupert and Milky Incorporated and Data Transfer Solutions LLC regarding the purchase and implementation of the View Works Enterprise Asset Management System and authorizing, authorizing appropriate city officials to make necessary budget adjustments and appropriations to further provide funding for these agreements. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a presentation. It's going to take me probably about 20 minutes to go through. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to take a break and, <laughs> or if you're ready just to plow through this. I apologize that this had to end on the same night as John and his stormwater presentation. Um, I. But it, this is really important, and okay. uh, you know, I'm sure this, you're, you're, we've, we've talked about this. Um, the city administrator with the strategic plan and what we've talked about, capital improvements program. This has been funded in the capital improvements program, and um, it's been a long time to, to get to this evening that we have agreements in place. And so, I want to just go through this this evening, explain what this is about, and the importance of it for not only just the Department of Public Works, but for the city of Sheboygan as a whole. 
So, there you go. One second. Out. We can keep going. I'm good. I'm ready. Plow through. Plow through. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else still online anymore? Do we need to still, still need to record? Right. Well, mm, they'll be, be able to see it. They'll see it. Okay. Is it working? Well, yeah, of course, their voices today. Okay. Well. Okay. Then I will do this. Uh, Is it going to work? Can you do a clicker? Oh, click click with the mouse onto the like that screen. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
infrastructure management as a whole has been really reactive and not proactive over the years. So we want to get to proactive management. So in order to get there, it needs comprehensive data, modeling information systems to help prioritize and identify where best to maximize our investment. This is our current state. We have tons and tons of legacy documents and books and paper like this in the, in the department. Just volumes. You remember, 150 years of data. Car catalogs of when streets were constructed, who did the work, what were the proceedings, everything's recorded on card catalogs. We have microfilm. We, 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 we actually got a little technical and we got from the 70s to the 90s stuff on microfilm. So we were working at it. And these are all our, 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 our individual plumbing records and sewer records that we also have for every single property in the city. I really want you to focus on, on this picture because everything that we do currently for design in mapping is digital and you can see the two screens with the road and design and work but you can see all the data is still in books so in order to research something we have to go to the right book it, and it makes it very difficult to look for relationships and, and search for data uh, it, it's it, it's very time consuming so I mentioned earlier on about our strategic plan, capital improvements, and working with City Administrator Wolf's office and, and, and talking about this. We have our core values of service, teamwork, accountability, innovation. This is going to be key. Respect, stewardship, and fiscal responsibility. And this, this, this program of the Enterprise Asset Management System really targets those areas. As well as we talked is the city administrator Wolf and we talked about some of our, our our past issues that we're trying to still address. Do you know it's older persons that we have our roads? You hear it every year. We need to invest in. We want more. We want better roads. We'll get fix them. We're tired of driving over potholes. Infrastructure as well. It's not just roads. We have sewers and, and other is assets including buildings to maintain. We just talked earlier about how this building is 56 years old. This generator needs, to, so it, it needs capital investment. Again, proactive, we need to extend the life of this building because in order to build a new building for a service building, it's probably 20 plus million dollars to replace this building if we had to start all over. So we're not doing that. We need to keep investing. So our fleet, we know we've made some investment, we, we entered a lease program, and we've, we've invested in upgrading our fleet. And finally, our employees. Employees are a great asset, but if we're not giving them the right data and they don't have access to it, um, they can't make good decisions. And so this program, again, moving forward, will allow for better decision making. So I real briefly want to talk about the life cycle of infrastructure. Talked about expansion. World War II, we're expanding, we're growing. But then it slows down and then we have to maintain what we have. We maintain, and that's where if we do the proper timing of maintenance, that's the best use of dollars. But eventually, you can only maintain buildings or equipment or so forth for so long, and then eventually it has to be reconstructed or replaced. This next slide talks about enterprise asset management alternatives, and it's not just public works. Public works serves not only the infrastructure for the community, but we also do internal services for the other departments. And this kind of shows how this program will affect all of these agencies within the city. That talked about that timeliness of maintenance again. If we are able to identify and pick the right asset our infrastructure piece and do the maintenance at the right optimal time, it's less expensive versus waiting for it to degrade and then fail and then replace because that's always more expensive. So a little background of our business problem. 
I talked about expansion, maintenance, reconstruction, right? Well, it's not linear. Those are all occurring at the same time. Every year we have the, the, some, some pressure to expand. We have this subdivision on the south side. We want to get some sewers down there. But we got to maintain this road because it's, it's starting to fail. And then, oh, let's get this totally replaced. They all go after the same dollar. So those are competing pressures, actually, that we're dealing with. So... EAM, Enterprise Asset Management. Well, it's a solution. It's going to help us. It's going to help us in terms of being able to identify things. So, and it's not, this isn't a new concept by any means. It's, it's really a computerized database system that will tie into our geographical information system. You heard it with, this, with the gentleman with the storm sewer, GIS, right? Mm -hmm. GIS is really a graphical map that has intelligent information attached to it. EAM provides that interface to provide that, that structure, that intelligence to it. This will actually serve as a, a mechanism for DPW to change our legacy operations, mainly get from the paper-based system to more of an electronic and interactive-based system. So we went through a selection process on this. It, we determined like the functional requirements, uh, addressing areas of operations that included a robust inventory management. We have a tremendous amount of inventory as I showed in that one slide. And that it could, you know, ultimately we, we have an old legacy mainframe system that some of our databases are in that isn't very intuitive and we're looking to retire that and, and, and move off of that. And that's part of a strategic plan that, is, that, you, that has been addressed as well. Vendor demonstrations were given by DTS ViewWorks and CityWorks. They were two vendors, and a third vendor was also reviewed but not invited to do um, a, an evaluation. So this is just slide really just talks about what, what went into the, the parameters. It talked about the functional requirements, system specifications, operational, and ultimately the maintenance of the system long-term. So DTS ViewWorks, which is in front of you this evening, has the ability to manage assets <clears throat> external to the city's GIS, geographical information or mapping system. So it doesn't necessarily have to have the map to work. Some of the systems you had to have the map, which is a great thing to have, but a lot of times if you're in a building, if you just have to look up a park and you're look, working on a furnace or something, I don't need a map to know what, what room I'm going to go look for the furnace, in other words. Uh, they had a great training plan that was both self-paced paced online, and it also we were having instructors come on site and help us with this. And it, you'll see in the next slide, it's significantly less money than the city works system. DTS for over a five-year cost period was four, is going to be about four hundred eighty-two thousand, where CityWorks was eight hundred plus. They they actually after they submitted it they said oops uh, we, we we can do better and they reduced it by about fifty or sixty. Still not enough to be competitive. So I want to take five minutes here because this this video will. Uh, provide really a good background in terms of what we're going to be accomplishing with this. You might have to click on it, Don. Okay. Because it's gone. <laughs> but you, yeah. nope. you have to go back into the presentation. Oh, sorry. And then we'll probably get an ad. Maybe we can skip it. <coughs> Four, three, two, one. Right, let's see if I can get to turn the sound. Turn, turn, the, turn the volume up right over here. Right here. I'm going to mute you. I'm going to have to mute this one then. Yeah. Okay. Where am I here? Well,
Can you hear me now? Let's do that, obviously. Yes. <clears throat> All right, that wakes on. Okay, well, let's just keep going. Okay. Oh, I think I heard yep, something. We're good. You can hear us good? Okay. All right. Okay. So, we talked about schedule, project planning, tracking. So, they're going to be partnering with us with, with the implementation. So the cost that's in, in your proposal, the software is about is 85,000 initially out of the box. And then annually, there's a $17,000 fee for maintenance and support and then hosting environment of 20,000. So annually, moving forward, we're looking at about 37,000 on an ongoing basis. That's why, you know, when you looked at you know, the four-year, the five-year cost, it was only about 400000 because after this initial outlay, the annual cost is, is much lower than the comparison uh, company. The, the 214500 that's going to be the big implementation. That's going to be actually loading the software, adding the data to all the computer systems, and Rupert Milky's time and effort. This is a two-year project. This isn't this isn't something we're going to buy and put on our computer and oh we're ready to go. It's it, as you can imagine, all that data needs to be built and and converted into the databases. So what's that return on that investment, right? I mentioned these three things are they're 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 all working. They're competing today. They're stretching that same dollar, right? <coughs> what we want to do with the EAM is get to the process where with the EAM, they all work together, in other words, instead of competing. So it's going to impact personnel. It's going to help with our equipment needs and material. We're going to have all of this together, this data funneling to better data and informed decisions, better decision making, because we'll have all that this, the right data at our fingertips versus taking the time to research in, a, in, a, in all those volumes. And, and quite frankly, we're getting to the stage where with new employees, they're not familiar with some of the areas and, and how to look this stuff up and, and, and have that background either. So there, there's, a, there's an element of succession planning as well here is what I'm, I guess I'm saying. So you know, our, our operating budget for the entire department, including wastewater and all of our activities, is $25 million a year. It's a lot of money. And we need to be good stewards and use that to our best ability so that when we're out there doing the repairs and doing the work we do every day, that it's being used properly and it's making a difference. Not to say that we're not making a difference today, but we don't want to. We don't want to go in and repair something that really didn't. Really, it, it has other plans and other infrastructure maybe that needs other repair. Right. And, and actually, in addition to the 25, we have four million roughly that we spend on capital improvements. So 29 million dollars every year for our city that we're spending. So the best possible use to make better decisions and and and, and time and do the maintenance at its proper time will help be good stewards of how we use this money. So the enterprise asset management system will allow the DPW to strategically be formed that preventative maintenance, extending the life of infrastructure. How does it do that? Well, again, it talks about resource management, managing our time and expenses, work management, <clears throat> tracking of citizen requests, where are the complaints coming in? We, we, we get complaints and issues every day that come into the department saying this needs to be fixed, this needs, well, if we're starting to be able to track that better and get a history on it and figure out, well, what, what's, what, what, why is this continuing here? We'll be able to better plan. And again, 
once we get this loaded, we'll be able to evaluate and, and assign condition assessment. We have good condition, you know, what's on the table in front of you tonight is our pavements. We do that today. And that's, that's probably just one little piece of the whole system. Now we want to take the pavement and determine, okay, out of those red, red, red pavements that we know we need to fix, which ones also have sewers that are bad versus that are good? So maybe you combine two projects. You're doing the sewer work and the road work and you get versus just, you know, fixing another road, in other words, without that. So planning. And then ultimately, how does it all factor into future capital budgets? Where are we forecasting? What kind of projects we're going to need? Some of them, you know, they, they show the mobile application. That's going to be fantastic for our work crews. And, and when we're out and about, we respond. We respond to it. Something that either, I'll use Mike's crew, they have a traffic signal down. They have to respond in their truck. Sometimes they get out there and they go, oof, and then they shut off the power, they, they barricade it off, and they get back in their truck and come back down here for the <clears> manuals <throat> and figure out what parts need to be. Instead, on a computer, it could be right there. Well, I'm at this location. Click, pull it up, find out what, what parts I need, what, what materials. So, again, citizens' requests come in or service requests. We generate work orders. We look at our resources that are available with the system and so forth. The picture on the left here is actually the Badger Lab project. And that has all brand new infrastructure that we put in. Storm sewers, sanitary sewer, water main, and now new streets underneath there. And it, this was in the video, but I just wanted to share it again. It talks about map and data sharing, the work management aspect, and ultimately strategic asset management. Knowing what we have condition will help us better plan and be better use of our money. And in the picture on the right is really just the uh, a, a snapshot of the geographic information system with now the data associated with it. Instead of having a book on your desk and looking at a book, it will be all in front of you. So again, I want to really go over this timeline. It's 24 months, two years. So it will be fully available in 2024. Now, it's it's got tasks. It's got it's going to be incrementally built. So we're going to maybe yeah, we're going to take we like I said our pavements are in good condition. <coughs> so let's build that and leverage what we have today, and, and and that could be a quick win. So it's not as if we're it's going to be 24 months and you're not going to see any production. You're going to see incremental progress on this project and through this. Through the 24 months, we're going to be coming back, and probably I will do, and with the team, we'll probably give you an update. We're going to say, hey, this summer, since this is where we at, we had our kickoff meeting, we're working on our state, our, our workflows. How do we take intake? How do we just? How do we? How do we just? You know, we really are going to describe everything we do into the computer system. So nine tasks, again, fully implemented in 2024. So our pillars of success, again, this matches our strategic plan. It addresses our infrastructure. Better customer service with our, our residents will be better able to respond, as well as our employees will have the proper tools to do, do their work. So um, with that, I think that's it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Did we budget for this? Yes. The whole amount? Yes. We have some money that we're, we're going to use some money this year. We had monies budgeted in the capital improvements program to fund this as well. So we have it budgeted over five years? Or? Uh, that, that initial, the initial amount is the, the, the 380 or 330. Yeah. 360, 390. Yes. That's, that's, that's in the budget. Now, I have to caution. I have some. We have to change some of the account numbers, but the but the number stays the same. The, the the budget number. It's just some of the numbers of where the funding comes from has to be adjusted a little bit. But yes. And just then, also, I'm just curious. 
um, is this going to be customized to us or is this something, it's a, a life management product that they do have and they apply to whatever, but yeah. they have to customize. There would be parts of it that are customized on uh, our city. Yes, so it, it, it has, for instance, from city to city to city, you have certain things that are that are uniform. For instance, a street's going to be, what types of pavement? Is it concrete? Or is it asphalt? Does it have curb and gutter? So it has some of those descriptions, but it does have fields that um, for each asset for, that's unique to Sheboygan, we're able to customize it. So it has has some flexibility built into it, but it's, it doesn't have to be totally customized right away. So there's some things that are going to be simple and easy for us to just start populating and putting in the fields for data. But there's other things, as you would say, that are customizable and it, it has that ability. And finally, very briefly, um, there is the old material that we have is not going to be no. No. transferred in any way, right? It's all it's, new data that is going to be built. We're going to we're going to start with the new data that we currently have. Some and that data won't go away. It will stay, stay but. There's some of the data that will need to be transferred from, from the legacy type of paper document into the system. That will probably be the most time consuming, but you're right. Most of it is more for reference and it will be a backup, but moving forward, we, 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 we want to know today. We want to know what today, what we have. Thank you. Go ahead, Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so. I've got a series of questions here, but this one piggybacks off, off of um, Alderperson Parabola's uh, previous question. Can you just give me an example of what's in the books that is like useful today? Uh, sure, there, there's, there's certain things such as pipe material, when it was, when it was constructed, the depth, the grade it's, it was built at, for instance, for sewers and got some it. of that. And, so, and, and there'll be some, some data in terms, of, in terms of benchmarks, in terms of where property corners are located and okay. some of the survey data. Those are in books. Uh -huh. uh, the plumbing records have details in terms of where a lateral for a, okay. a sewer or a water is coming to a home and the depth of it. Okay. And some of that. So that, that's key, especially when we're doing design yep. and wanting to put a new sewer in. We want to avoid those utilities. So we, it, it, it's just a good reference check, in other words. And some paper stuff is really accurate. And it's a lot better than just digging a hole and seeing what you find and cheaper right. too. Exactly. Okay. Got it? You can trust okay. it. Uh, second question would be what are the three environments that we're paying for through ViewWorks? I'm guessing one is city streets. And then there's two other things, or how does what are, what is that? Yeah, that's the the hosting environments. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think what that will be is the three environments. With it, some of it's in the web. Okay. And it, like a cloud-based. Okay. Hosted environment. Then we have on-premise. Okay. For the enterprise version, and I, I'm going to be remiss. I, the other one I think is a mobile, where it's for the mobile application. Yeah, okay. So it's just how we're going to be able to operate the system. Correct. Um, then uh, my next question would be, it said in the video that we would have the ability to look at images of the city streets. Mm -hmm. How often are, is an entire mapping of the city going to take place so we know what it actually looks like? We, at this stage, we are not proposing, that would be an add-on. Got it, okay. To do that. And we feel that with our current inspection mm -hmm. that we're doing today, that we have and we, and we have a good database because we have to do this with the state of Wisconsin, the DOT, that what we have currently is in, in good, um, a good solid database. I think what we, we, we've been able to use, utilize Google Maps mm, okay. and some of the free applications <laughs> out there. And you know, okay, and Sheboygan's not that big, and we, we, if we really have an issue, we can drive out there. Yes, okay. okay. So we didn't feel that that was a real value added. Now, if we were in Chicago, Mets, yes. you know, something where it's, yeah. but for us, we, we just didn't seem as justified to, to spend that extra money for that. Understood. Then my last question uh, has to do with the inventory purchasing work orders type of thing. Um, how are you doing that today, and how will that, versus how we're going to do that tomorrow? 
Yeah. You know, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. We're not. So you never know how many batteries you have. You never know how many. We we have we have, we have inventory, and I ha I could go back to the stock room, and I could talk to our stock room person, and he could get that data okay. for pretty quickly. But in terms of, uh, we do limited work orders, for instance, on what I would say damage report. If we have an okay. accident, yep, we'll put that on a work order. But every day type of activity, we track internally a little bit with spreadsheets and. And it's not integrated necessarily in a complete system. So for us, when we create our annual report, it is very time consuming for all the superintendents to recreate and track everything. I mean, they, they kind of each individual superintendent has their own method instead of being integrated and coordinated. So again, um, it, this is going to be this is going to be a, a, a you know, a real paradigm shift for what, how we operate and how we track things. It's, it's, really, it's really needed for good business, um, quite frankly. That, those were my questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any questions? All right. I make a motion to approve this. So the motion, excuse me. Uh, okay. With amendments as follows. <laughs> <laughs> to make some adjustments on Just, the operating budget account numbers. So, right. Okay. So. Do you want me to say, um, I, I make a motion to approve as amended per the operational account number changes. Right. Is that good? Okay. Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a motion and a second. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Thanks. Just so you know, I, I um, talking with the uh, administrator, Wolf, I will be making the same presentation to the whole council on Monday so the other older person can understand since it, okay. since it is such a large project and it, it's going to be over two years. Okay. And it's a nice presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I mean, not tiring at nice all. Nice and short. <laughs> <laughs> like the storm water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pulling out that video might be a good idea to sway some people because I thought we were getting road view done every year, yeah. and, it, and they say you know, cutting edge technology, but it looks like 2002. Okay. And it, 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 it was a little clunky in terms of how we have to. It doesn't embed itself into the presentation. So, good, good suggestion. Okay. In my, in my little experience, I would rec I would predict that it will take more than 24 months. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you, just, just I, like, I have gone through this type of projects with, with other type of life management projects. And yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the training will be a nightmare. So just ready for that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the war <laughs> <Thanks for the, laughs> <thanks for> <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can die anyway. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 RO number 106-21-22, document 7.1, a communication from Dr. Toby Watson requ requesting permission to place four donated pianos with city with winter covers on city right-of-way at various locations in the downtown and riverfront to continue, continue to foster Sheboygan's place basking strategy to activate city streets. So, or do we... I've got a question to start off with. Sure. Okay. Um, did we uh, did we get any sort of resolution from the city attorney's office on what we're doing with this? We, we have it. Talk about it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I have an email from uh, attorney Thomas Cameron, say, stating that uh, they've successfully negotiated the donation and agreement with Dr. Watson regarding the pianos. Cool. So. Um, uh, just trying to paraphrase this. With that said, the, the committee, I think the one just brought back, the, he's recommending that we put uh, a report of officer back on the Public Works Committee agenda for uh, the meeting. We can give a quick update and ask basically the committee to hold this. Okay. And based on how you feel, 
he would, um, uh, what's he recommending? <laughs> he's recommending a hole so he can put it's everything in. There you go. Okay. Hold. So Just good. He, he's got an agreement, but hold it. And okay. he'll have the documents for yeah. you to refer yeah. the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Move to hold. There was no document revaluing. That yes, that's right. Correct. There you go. Okay. So right. it's coming. But the, just, just, just the update yeah. is, is that he's been he's successful with the it. piano. Okay. So, okay. so yeah. make a, it will be coming back. I'll make a motion to hold to our next meeting. Okay. <laughs> Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That is done. That is on hold. <laughs> okay. All Next right. meeting date, December 28th, 2021. Seeing as we've exhausted the agenda, <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion to All those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Terrible, it's I. That is a proof we are adjourning. Oh, I will not be here.